Welcome back to 12Y Data Visualization in the Social Sciences. This short video is designed to walk you through the directions for our first theory challenge. Remember that our theory challenges are the large assignments in this class that give you the opportunity to apply the skills that you've been learning to an important theoretical question or prediction out of various social sciences. Our first theory challenge asks you to analyze data to assess whether there's some kind of connection between social media and depression among teenagers, and whether any potential connection between those two variables depends on teenagers' gender. The background for this theory challenge comes from this particular study that's cited at the top of the theory challenge directions. And the study's goal is to assess whether the amount of time that teenagers spend using social media online is associated with depression or anxiety among teenagers. And the way that the researchers uh, tried to answer this potential question is by collecting data on teenagers, the extent to which they experience depressive symptoms, how much time they're spending on social media, and their self-identified sex. The motivation for this question is that there's been a finding in several studies that people who spend more time in so using social media online wind up experiencing more anxiety and depression. And the theory behind that is that when we're spending time online, we wind up comparing ourselves to the way that people portray themselves on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter. And the way people portray themselves online isn't necessarily an accurate reflection of the way that they're experiencing their lives. People tend to want to post the best possible version of what's going on in their lives. So when we, we compare our experiences to this idealized version of what other people are experiencing, it might make it seem like we're experiencing more difficult or stressful situations, or in general just having fewer exciting highlights than the people that we see in the internet. And this comparison, this way that we unfavorably compare our daily lives to these idealized versions of the internet, might be a source of depression and anxiety. So the more we do this, the more depressed or anxious we might feel. It's also possible, given what we know about the psychology of um, this kind of social pressure, that it'll be stronger for female teenagers than it is for male teenagers. We know that women experience stronger social pressures than men to be sociable or um, to kind of have a positive physical appearance, they're scrutinized for it more, they experience stronger peer pressure, and given this gender difference and the extent to which male and female teenagers experience peer pressure or negative scrutiny from others, then we might think that the connection between using social media and experiencing depression is stronger among teenage girls than it is among teenage boys. So the data you'll analyze for the theory challenge to test for these possible associations comes from data on 80 teenagers that took a survey about their social media usage and experiences of depressive symptoms. The teenagers self-identified as female or male. Teenagers can self-identify as many more genders than just male or female, but because the researchers in this study were interested in the specific gender difference between men and women teenagers, they focused on male and female self-identified teenagers. In the survey, the teenagers also reported the usual amount of time that they spent using social media each day. And the way the researchers measured this was to create three categories. Low meat social media usage was less than every day. So I don't even go on once a day to check Facebook, Instagram, whatever. Moderate was I'm going online every day, but it's for less than an hour. High usage is I'm going online every day and I'm spending an hour or longer across all the different social media platforms. Finally, the teenagers answered a series of questions about depressive symptoms. In surveys, when you're trying to measure depression, it's often a little bit tricky because if you just ask people, are you depressed? The way people interpret that question or the way that they define depression could vary from one person to the next. And so it's hard to get accurate answers. 
So the way researchers usually try to measure things like depressive symptoms is to ask people about a large number of very specific feelings or experiences and how often they experience them. And then they collect data across this wide range of symptoms in order to come up with a more accurate measure. These questions might be things like, um, how many days out of the past seven days um, have you felt extremely sad? Or has it been um, a large amount of effort just to get out of bed and do normal tasks? How many days in the past week um, have you been unable to stop yourself from crying? So very specific depressive symptoms that people can accurately report yes or no, I've been experiencing this, and how often. And when they collect the data across all of those different measures, they can summarize it into one single measure for whether they've been experiencing depressive symptoms. For this uh, particular data set that you'll analyze in the theory challenge, a yes for depressive symptoms means that the teenager experiences symptoms more than the national average, and a no means that they've been experiencing depressive symptoms less than the national average. So it turns into a yes or no measure for experiencing depressive symptoms. In the data, um, the Excel spreadsheet that you'll get, it looks like this. There's going to be four columns in the data. And remember that every column, when you're looking at raw data in an Excel spreadsheet, represents a variable. So there are four columns, but the first column just gives the number of the participant. That's like an administrative piece of information that helps the researchers keep track of which person was reporting this information. So that participant number is there for an administrative reason, but it doesn't necessarily give you meaningful information for the purpose of the study. That just leaves three variables. Self-identified sex with two levels, male and female, self-identified social media usage, low, moderate, or high, and depressive symptoms, yes or no. And then each row gives the information from a single participant. In the directions for the theory challenge, there are some excerpts from our analysis plan that we've used in the various triads and um, in the week one of the lecture for the class. And the analysis plan helps you organize the information that's in the triad, or I'm sorry, the theory challenge data to help you figure out what kind of analysis you need to do. And there are three variables in the data. Our first variable was sex. How was it measured? It was with worded categories, male and female. That makes it a categorical variable. Can sex be a predictor? Well, if we can examine differences in the other variables by whether somebody identifies as male or female, that means that sex can be a predictor. Can it be an outcome? If our other variables in the data are social media usage and depression, it's unlikely that somebody's experiences of depression or somebody's social media usage is going to change how they identify in terms of being male or female. And so we'd say no, this variable probably cannot be an outcome. Our second variable is social media usage. How do we measure it? We measured it with three different levels, low, moderate, and high. Those are worded categories. Can it be a predictor? Well, we are beginning this uh, exploration by trying to understand whether social media use is what is driving people's experiences of depressive symptoms. That's the theoretical question we're trying to address with this study. So yes, social media use can be a predictor. Could social media use also be an outcome? Well, let's think about the other variables in our data set. If sex can be a predictor of the other variables in the data set, could sex potentially predict social media use? Like, could somebody identifying as male or female have different levels of social media usage on average? Sure. Sex could be a predictor for social media usage. So we would say, yes, yeah, social media use could also be an outcome. The final variable is depressive symptoms. We measured it with categories, yes or no. Could it be a predictor? This one's a little tricky. So our study is trying to figure out whether people that use social media use, uh, have high social media use or versus low social media use might have different levels of depressive symptoms. That means that social media use predicts depressive symptoms. But what about the opposite? Is it possible that when people are experiencing depressive symptoms, it also drives them to spend more time alone, spend more time online, potentially using social media? So maybe yes, maybe depressive symptoms could also be a predictor for social media use. Can depressive symptoms be an outcome? Yes, 
That's the whole point of the study, is trying to figure out whether social media use and sex predict depressive symptoms. Now let's think about what the patterns in our data might look like if the researchers are correct versus if they're not. So first, we expect that teenagers who use social media more heavily have more depressive symptoms than people with lower social media use. Then we're wondering whether it dep depends on gender. First, let's look in that column that says prediction of proportion with depressive symptoms if the association is the same by gender. That's another way of saying, what if the effects of gender and social media use on depressive symptoms are additive? So the less than, greater than, and equal to signs, that's about whether we expect higher or lower depressive symptoms, depending on whether they have high or low social media use. So first, among teenage girls, what do we expect? Is it that people with higher social media use have more depressive symptoms, lower depressive symptoms, or the same depressive symptoms versus people with low social media use? If we think social media drives depressive symptoms, then it would be higher. We would expect a higher percent of teenage girls to be depressed when they use social media a lot versus when they don't. And then in this top portion where it asks if it's an additive association, it means that it's the same by gender. That means we expect the same pattern for boys. For both teenage boys and girls, we think that depression will be more common for high social media users than low social media users. The next column refers to an interaction. It says, what is the prediction of the proportion of people with depressive symptoms if the association is only among girls? So this association between social media use and depression depends on gender. Well, if we think that this association exists among teenage girls, we would say the same thing. We would say that we expect to see a higher level of depression among high social media users versus low social media users. But if we don't expect that association to exist among teenage boys, then what would we expect? We would expect an equal sign. We would say that the level of depression might be the same whether they use social media a lot versus just a little. And that's what the interaction refers to. It's that there is a connection between social media use and depression, but it depends on whether somebody identifies as a female or as a male. And then what we'll do is compare the results from the data with these two different scenarios to try to understand if the data are showing evidence of an interaction versus evidence that the effects are additive. In our analysis plan, that's where we can start filling out what are the different combinations of variables that we will need to examine in order to uncover all of the potential patterns in our data. So remember that our variables were one, sex, two, social media use, and three, depressive symptoms. So if we're looking at variables one and two, it's sex and social media use. Of those two variables, social media use would be the outcome and sex would be the predictor. The describe column is asking, how do we summarize that information? We summarize count or categorical variables with counts or with percentages. How would we look at the relationship between them? So what kind of tool would we use to describe the potential association between sex and social media use? We could use a table or we could use a column chart. What about variables one and three, sex and depressive symptoms? Of those two, depressive symptoms would be the outcome. Sex would be the predictor. How would we describe them? They're both categorical variables. So again, we'll use a percent or a count and then we'll use a table or a column chart to display the connection between the variables. Finally, variables two and three was depressive symptoms and social media use. Which one's the outcome? Well, the researchers are trying to discover whether social media use predicts depressive symptoms. So in our analysis, we will use depressive symptoms as our outcome, and then we will predict it with social media use. But in our write-up, it's important that we point out that it's possible that the relationship works the other way. It's possible that depressive symptoms are what's causing social media use rather than the other way around. In all reality, probably some of both of these processes is happening, and it's hard for us to know with these type of survey data how much it's one way versus the other. So the way we'll examine it is the way that the researchers are setting out trying to uncover the relationship with depressive symptoms as the outcome. 
but on our write-up, we'll let the reader know that they should be pretty cautious when they're interpreting these associations. Finally, we should look at how all three variables relate to one another. What's our outcome? Well, if the goal of the study is to predict depressive symptoms, depressive symptoms is our outcome. Our two predictor variables are just the two variables that are left in the data, social media use and sex. All of these are categorical variables, so we're using the same methods to describe them with percentages and to visualize their association with tables and with column charts. My recommendation for thinking about the analysis plan is to think back to recent examples from the triad activities, the lab quiz data, and the examples that we've gone over in lecture. How is the setup of this theory challenge and these data similar to the data that we've looked at in the past? In the past, we've looked at data that have an outcome variable that's categorical and two predictor variables that are also categorical. So how should the analysis of these theory challenge data be similar to the analysis from the triad lab quiz and lecture data? At the end of the instructions, there's also some tips to help guide you through your analysis and what kind of information to put in your write-up. I recommend looking very closely at these directions where it says some questions to consider. Make sure your write-up gives the information that answers each one of these questions, potentially in this order. And you can treat this list of questions to consider like they were a checklist. So did you first describe the composition of the sample in terms of gender, social media usage, and depressive symptoms? We need to know how many people are in these different categories and combinations of categories. How common are depressive symptoms? How many people self-identified as male versus female? How many people use social media high, low, or moderate levels? Then is social media usage associated with depressive symptoms? Is there a gender difference in depressive symptoms? Is there a gender difference in social media usage? Do social media usage and gender interact in these effects? All of those four questions are asking about relationships between variables in the data. And for any given relationship that you're looking at, you're probably going to want some kind of a chart or table that explains whether you see evidence for that kind of association in the data. Finally, can the data definitively show that social media causes mental well-being? Why or why not? So in the narrative of our write-up, we'll want to begin with a brief introduction that explains the purpose of the data analysis. What questions are we trying to answer? And where do the data come from that help us address the question? Then we want to provide a conclusion that briefly summarizes what the answers to those questions are and if there's any potential important details that we should be aware of when we're interpreting those answers. So should we be cautious about understanding these associations as being causal or not? I also recommend going through the rubric that's posted for the theory challenge, which breaks down for you the points attached to each portion of the write-up. Again, I recommend treating that rubric like it's a checklist. Before you turn anything in or when you're going to your peer review in your lab next week, go through each portion of that rubric and see if you have that portion represented in your lab write-up. Does, e does each portion of your lab write-up fit the criteria and details that are described in the rubric? So all of these materials are posted on Canvas for you to look at under the Theory Challenge Assignment. I recommend looking through the directions and rubric very closely before you get to work on your theory challenge. Then start working with the data and go in a similar fashion as you did with similar kinds of data in the triads, lab quiz, and the lecture write-ups. And then in your write-up, try to follow that same format that's outlined in this particular section of the directions where you're addressing each one of these questions. If you're doing that, then you should be in terrific shape. Your peer review on uh, Friday, when you're going through this in lab, should give you an opportunity to see how different people in your class have tried to demonstrate these potential associations in different ways, which ways are more effective or highlight people's attention to that association most um, significantly or most directly. And you can get advice from the TAs and the lab instructors on whether you are analyzing the data correctly, whether you're describing it correctly in your write-up. Have fun with the theory challenge and we look forward to seeing what you all submit.